nice to do that. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Jack Bullen, I'm the director of Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair. Uh, we've been going for five years now. Um, unfortunately, like everything this year, we've had to go virtual. Um, uh, so thank you for joining us virtually. Um, uh, I'm just going to, I'm just on here to introduce you both to uh, Vincent Eames and Jason Hicklin. Um, uh, Vincent is uh, the director and co-founder of Eames Fine Art uh, that has numerous spaces, uh, th three or four, uh, in and around Bermondsey, um, where, where they are going to be doing their discussion from in the new, brand new print room. Um, they've been exhibiting with us, I think this is your third year now, isn't it? Um, which is uh, fantastic. And, uh, and uh, Jason Hicklin, who, um, from, who is uh, sort of a fantastic uh, printmaker and artist, and uh, is actually head of printmaking at City and Guilds of London Art School, um, who actually uh, taught me all about printmaking and uh, is one of the reasons that uh, this fair uh, exists. So um, I'm going to leave you in their hands to talk about um, the, the print room at City and Guilds and sort of the importance of uh, passing on these traditional skills. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to pass you over to you two. Thank you, Jack. That's Thanks, great. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and yes, uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Eames Fine Art Print Room. Um, as Jack says, uh, this is our new space on Bermondsey Street. It's just down the road from our other gallery. Um, and it's been open just under a year now. Um, we'd originally hoped to run this discussion and uh, demonstration from the Sitting Guilds print room. We do. Um, but for COVID restrictions and also a rather flaky Wi-Fi signal, um, that hasn't been possible. So we are um, a plan B here at Eames Fine Art Print Room. Very happy to be so. That's a good plan B. Um, and it's, uh, well, it seems an appropriate place, Jason, because uh, we've um, hosted you and your work here numerous times. Yeah. Um, we actually have your work on the wall in our uh, current exhibition, A Common Place, uh, which is a mixed show collaboration of writers and artists uh, that you can see uh, through the window <laughs> um, or online. Um, and hopefully we can welcome you all back next week, fingers crossed, to actually look at it all in the flesh. Um, so, yes, welcome back, Jason. Yes, and you, um, delighted uh, that I can join you here for this discussion. Oh, um, we are, we do have some footage from Sitting Guild's print room that we're going to show you. Jason has very kindly put together some footage um, of uh, teaching there uh, that you put, uh, you put together it's, a couple of days It's ago. a very brief guy. I just took a little bit of footage from the actual room one afternoon last week. And Tom at Eames Fine Art kindly has pieced it together with a bit of a voiceover. So it just hopefully just gives you a flavour of the room that we can't be sitting in this afternoon. But it, it's, it just gives you a little flavour of what we're about and um, what we'll be talking about shortly. So what I think we should do is why don't we um, set the scene for the discussion with this film now and yeah, then uh, we can get on the discussion. So I'm going to try and do, I'm going to share that with you now is the plan. And there we go. Welcome to the Engraving School at the City and Girls of London Art School. A room established over a hundred years ago and still providing teachings in traditional techniques. Everything in an etching studio has its own place. Stereos kept clean for degreasing plates, hot plates for applying hard wax and soft wax. The cleaning up area, white spirits and meths and all the rags that you'll need. And next door to that is the acid cabinet. In this case, we're using nitric acid to etch zinc plates. The dirty sink is essential. The dirty sink for washing your hands. Inking up area, the jiggers and then the aquatic box. Applied and fused and there's the clear sink for soaking paper. And central to the room are the two cast iron presses. An aquatint needs to be fused onto the plate. We do this at the City and Girls with a gas poker. The flames held underneath the plate 
until the rosin starts to change colour. At this point, the aquatint rosin is fused to the plate and the plate is ready to be submerged in the acid to etch that drawing into the metal. The only way an etching can be printed is by ink being forced into the plate. It's truly a hands-on experience. The ink is rolled onto the plate and then the ink pushed into the metal plate with scrim or tarlatan. Circular motion is the ideal motion and the ink finds its way below the surface of the plate into the etch marks. Once the plate has been inked up, it is ready to be taken to the press. Once the plate has been inked up, it is placed on the press along with soft felt blankets. These are to protect the paper and the plate away from the cast iron roller and the heavy amount of pressure is about to go under. The press is wound and the impression is forced from the plate onto the dampened paper. This is the only way an etching can be printed. Roll the press to the end of the blankets. Blankets can be lifted. Then the image revealed. The paper keeps the back of the paper clean and now can be. The paper is lifted and the impression on the paper. Once the plate has been inked up, it's been put on the press bed and wound through the press. At this point, the paper can be lifted and the inked up plate revealed and the ink has been forced from the plate onto the paper. Okay, well, thank you. I hope we're all back and can hear us uh, continue. Um, thank you for that, Jason. Thank you for putting that, that together. I don't um, think there'll be an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a nice to have a bit of a flavour of what yeah. we're talking about. And, yeah. and it's very much um, a discussion of, well, what we call, I guess, a traditional print route, isn't it? In the that, city and girls. Is that a fair description I, th I think the word tradition i think it's as close to a hands-on experience of, in printmaking especially in tagler printmaking that that one is likely to um to 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 be taught in it's, an, it's a great teaching environment well we want to unpick that a bit and explain what traditional methods mm. are explore those ideas a bit and how important they are why they're important why you do it that way at City and Guilds we want to make this as interactive as possible so we are open yeah. to uh, questions from you so they use the Q&A or the chat um, as a way of getting questions to us and we'll try and cover as many of those Absolutely. as we can um, so let's start with the basics what do we mean by a traditional method and how is that expressed in the, in the printing I, I think the way it's expressed at the City and Guilds, uh, I, I teach and the City and Guilds is set up in exactly the same way that the Central School of Art was set up. The print room there was what we call a traditional professional studio and I was taught by artists how to use that room and that is something I have continued into the City and Guilds because it was the way I was taught, it's the only way I know how to teach 
And from what I learned at the, at the city at um, Central, it, it was the correct way to be talked. Correct way. And we're talking acid baths, aqua tint, absolutely the lovely, yeah. fantastic Russia presses that you've got. All the real, the real deal. Yeah, we're working with waxes, we're working with acids, and things that a lot of art schools decided to get rid of, or print studios got rid of, they were worried about health and safety aspects, and decided for whatever their reasons not, not to have them anymore. I was lucky at City and Guilds, I was given the chance by a uh, principal for Michael Kenny, and approached the guy who taught me, Norman Ackroyd, about him being involved in the print room there, and Norman then suggested that I worked at City, at City and Guilds, and we just continued this complete flow from the central it's a lineage it's a complete lineage from from the central yeah. right back from the central but i think the point to emphasize is and i think this is fair to say for someone who's outside of the edu art education establishment as it were this is quite rare what Absolutely. you're doing at city and guilds it, it is quite rare in the sense that i i only have to teach etching yeah i don't have to get involved in assessments um, marking work or programs i simply walk in and my day is spent working with students on their etching problems and their, their etching solutions as well. <laughs> so so it's okay. But it's very much a hands-on. It is absolutely hands-on experience. I was, yeah, I was once offered an office at City and Girls, <laughs> and I, I, I sort of said, if you give me an office, you'll find office work for me to do. I, okay. I have a corner of a workbench. You occupy a corner of a workbench. Just a corner, okay. only a corner. And so my toolbox is there, and I, I loiter there and look out for. Uh, What's going on here. So this is very much teaching by showing, is that right? And that's experience. You get, yeah, I mean, you, you were, we were talking earlier about you don't do handouts. You don't no. take, you, people start taking notes and they stop taking notes. So they, they understand, students understand they have to really immerse themselves in the doing. Is Absolutely, right? there's no time for notes. Once you'll be, once they start, you know, you can start off with notes, but after about 20 minutes, you realize like, you've got to get stuck in here. Mm. And so every process we do, the student is shown how it's done. We do it with them then they're let free to do what they want to do with this process. They're, they're, sh they're shown the way to do it and then they do it. And this is an artist showing the students as We're well. We're all, everyone who works at City and Girls has to be a practicing artist, but there is no other way you're taught. So yeah, we're all practicing artists. Okay. How does that work then for you as an artist, as a teacher? I mean, I think you mentioned there's this wonderful quote, a duty to teach. I think so, yeah. Leibson. I remember Daniel Leibson yeah. talks about, that as an architect, his duty to teach. And I, that's really struck a chord with me. It's something that was passed on to me, and the reason I do what I do in the City of Hills is to pass it on, as simple as that. And that is also something that I guess can work to your benefit in terms of finding solutions to problems with your students. That's creatively nourishing for you as well. Is that, it is, is absolutely. You learn by I, teaching. I think you learn a lot. Well, I, I feel that I need to learn from teaching. So often you'll, a student will come with a problem that isn't a problem I would have come across because maybe it's not a method I use, but immediately it takes you down another avenue. You're thinking, how can I help? How can I solve this problem? And then some of those solutions, I do sneak back to my studio. Because there's <laughs> some of those good ideas. You know, well, why not? I, 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 that's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, the point, isn't it? It's a fair but, game. But you've got this, the, the whole point is this room is a platform for sharing knowledge. It's, all, it's not just about instruction, it's about collaboration, it's about sharing ideas. Absolutely. And right. a generosity as well. I, I think, think the way in being taught at Central, the, the, the teaching was, yeah, in the spirit, it was a generous spirit behind it. And I was always taught to be completely open about your teaching and open about your methods. If you're asked, how, do I, how, do, how did you do that? Tell them everything. There's yeah. no secrets to this business, just it's completely open. And if a student does um, copies exactly what I've said, it will be different. They'll have their own input into it. That's interesting. And because yeah. as well, it's a process, things will happen that you cannot control. <laughs> and but then again, that you, you hope for that sometimes. But that's the beauty of printmaking. Absolutely. And, um, absolutely. As someone who has only learned about this from second hand, as it were, I've tried a bit of printmaking myself spectacularly unsuccessful <laughs> but there is that wonderful sort of alchemy about it which i think is this magic that you can impart and this sounds like the best environment to do it if you know I, what I, mean. I think so and i think what, it, what you also need though to do this is an infrastructure behind you okay. when i first worked at city Hill, i needed to the trust from the principal that i knew what i was doing 
And also that, again, I go have that generosity of spirit and of teaching to pass on everything, everything I, I knew. And, and I, I still have that support from City of Guilds. I need to be trusted what I do. Is. It sounds like they give you time there as well. They let you kind of get on with it because they trust you. They trust me. And also, it's all I do. I don't do anything else. This is what I do. And so I don't feel as if it's, I'm, I'm not, it's not a great wrench from the studio. I simply walk from one studio into another. There's a couple more people there that are usually in my studio. So, but that's, I just simply walk in. And because I've laid the studio out as I was taught, it's, my studio is laid out in the same way. Sure. As the central is laid out. I'd like to come onto this in a bit more because I find that aspect of this fascinating. Mm. Um, but there was one thing I wanted to mention about um, the, the importance of the fellow program, the fellowship program at the City and Guilds. Can you tell us a, a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I, I, so I've been working at City and Guilds now for over 20 years. And the, one of the ideas Michael Kenny, Norman and myself talked about was the idea of a fellowship, which would be offered to a, a graduating MA student, not just from City and Guilds, but from any, any um, college in the country, and we would offer an opportunity to extend mm. their time in a workshop and their time in a college. Okay. So what they have is one or two days a week where they work as a fellow alongside the tutors, yeah. in which they're taught how to teach, how to run a studio, to become a technician if that's what they want to be, and also to continue their own work. The biggest thing as a printmaker when you leave college is I haven't got a press anymore. But at the City and Guilds, when the fellowship program, they have that place. This gives you this vital link, you know, vital, vital next step. And, and the, tool, the, tool, the tools to do your job. But yeah, the next step, what do you do when you leave college? So the fellowship is that idea that will take you through this route of now really learning the business, really getting under the skin of it. Okay. And also continuing your own work, that's important. And being able to ask us questions about what they're doing if they need to. But it's interesting that that then folds back into bringing the next generation of students along through the room, as it were. Through the room. Um, and everyone who now teaches at City and Guilds with me was on the fellowship programme. Okay. So they all come through as fellows. You know, this is this wonderful way of nurturing and yeah. passing knowledge on and ensuring that it continues. Well, absolutely. So. That, that, what it gives us then is consistency in teaching methods. Everyone who teaches with me, I know when I'm not there, they're teaching in exactly the same way as I would teach. So the student is not confused, the student is at lost, and isn't given misleading information where they say, can say to me, oh, well, so-and-so told me to do it this way. I know that's not what they were told, yeah. because we don't teach that way. So yeah, it's consistency, and I think that helps the room and it helps the students as well. Okay, so I think that's, that's, that's an important point is that you mentioned that the fellows understand how to run a room as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, can you explain what you mean a bit about that? I mean, because there's, there's clearly a way of doing things in the print room. There, there is. You have to have a discipline of some sort. Not a, not a discipline that hinders you, but a discipline that helps you. Yeah. You know the presses are set properly. They're oiled. The, the pressure is correct. The pressure is never altered. The blankets are clean. The, the jiggers for inking up are clean as they should enough as they can be. The ink's consistent, the, the hot plates at the correct temperature, the rollers are clean, the acid is fresh. All of these things, all of these things uh, make have it to have, you have to have consistency. So you don't really then have to think about them. And also the way the room is laid out, how it's organized. The layout is crucial. The press is essential to the room, as you saw. And so we work around those presses. And often when I, I look up and a student's asking a question, I can probably guess what the question is by where they're standing. Where in the room. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if, they, if they end up in, a, if they've gone too quickly from one spot to the next, they've missed something else. Something else. You've missed That's something. Yeah. And so it, it enables you to, to manage the room. And so the fellows... And is this similar to the way your studio works? Absolutely. And the way Norman's studio works yep. before? And so the central works. All of our studios are built on that same model. So I, I could probably go blindfold into Norman's studio and I can really? still remember the central studio. I know what was underneath the jiggers. I know where the rollers were hanging. I know what, it, all of that consistency is, is crucial. And I guess the point to make here is that this isn't just trying to create identical artists. They're not, you're try, not trying to force them into a way of working. 
Not all. This is a way of working that has been refined, has yes. been found to work. Yes. And also, this is a shared space. Absolutely. It's not, this is a studio that has to work for everybody. It's it a does. place for collaboration. And if, if it doesn't work for a lot of people, it'll go it, wrong. It goes wrong. Yeah. If, things, if, if the rollers aren't clean, the hot plates aren't clean, things go wrong. And those problems just accumulate. And so in the end, the whole studio starts to collapse. Yeah. So yes, you do need a, a, a discipline. Again, that discipline doesn't hinder. It just means work gets made. Work gets yeah. clear. There's yeah. clarity and economy as well. You're not well, wasteful. Interesting. You're not wasteful. Well, you were talking about that earlier. I was got, uh, my ears pricked up there because I mean, economy. you've got to. Right. But it's it, it's it's about re reminding students that mm. to make a living out of this, they are going to have to pay attention to things like that. Absolutely. You know, the the most efficient way of working. Yeah. the most cost-effective cost way effective. of working. I mean, well. I, I, mean I, was, I was taught by a Yorkshireman. Ah, well, <laughs> I mean, there was no waste in that studio. And there's, it's true though, when, you, you know, you, even things like you cut, you buy a sheet of metal, you cut the metal economy, uh, economic economic, way. Yeah. You, you cut paper in an economic way. You don't waste, it, it costs money. And you're right, if you want to earn a living, you do have to... And this sort of studio craft is, is passed down from I, generation I, to generation. When I, when I printed an edition, or I, I pride myself on the lack of waste. If, if there's tiny off, I know I've done my job properly. Uh, yeah, and you get a buzz from knowing that's the, it's an economic way of work. And yeah, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I would like to think the students who stick with us and the fellows, and they have the idea that they will want, one day want to make a living from this. Yeah. And I think that's what attracted me right at the beginning was, I saw a pathway to make a living from this. And that's important, isn't it? Because the fellows, they, they, they're they on the next step yeah. into making a livelihood out of Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. They've gone from being a student now to being a fellow, the, the independence is coming their way. And then they, they're getting stronger, ready to then, yeah, become an independent artist for their own workshop or yeah. a shared workshop. I think that um, this this really is bringing together the whole way that the the, the sitting girls printing manifests this ethos about a traditional way of working, a way that works, yeah. that enables print to flourish, enables creativity to flourish, and it's not about it's not about creating restrictions, no, but it's about no. having processes that have to be respected. Like, there are parameters there that yeah. have to, because there's no way around it. There's no, there's no shortcuts. I mean, you, you can get quicker at things, you can get a bit more slick sometimes, but shortcuts will lead to problems. Um, but because the room is laid out in such a way and you're taught in that way, hopefully you start to forget about the layout. You forget, it just becomes a complete natural way of working. You've, in a clockwise way around the room, perhaps, or you do this in a certain order. And you're doing it in that order because I've been taught that this works. And the guy who taught me was taught that this works. It's not an obstacle. Yes. It's, it's opening the door rather than slamming it in front of you. So these actually create, they, they, they liberate you these processes absolutely. rather than being, yeah. being some way of sort of constraining. And they're not, yeah, absolutely. And then what you can often see, some students, I'm not saying that all students completely fall in love with this. You can almost see it. Some are getting it. Others think, I'm never going to print this room. <laughs> this is just mad in here. But hopefully the ones that see you can see that they have that way of thinking, of, of, of looking for solutions. And all we're giving them is a room where those solutions can be found. Yeah. So the solutions are there. And you're giving them the support for that as well. Absolutely. So there's the structure of the room, the organization of the room. And I'm the as a guy and the guys in the room. But I don't always have sometimes I have to figure out the solutions as well. You know, I have that problem in my own work, just as having a student's work. There are solutions and so you've learned you've learned things from your students okay. all the time. I think that's the only way you can keep teaching is to yeah. learn it and be open and be honest. And if you're stumped by a problem, say look. I need an hour to think about this. I need a cup of coffee and I just need to think about this before I send on a certain path. And, you know, I enjoy those problems. I yeah. really get a buzz from something else. I guess, though, I mean, enabling your students to find the solutions themselves is what you're actually trying to teach. Yes. Isn't it? Independence. Independence. Yeah. Independence. And I think opportunity to, to have that. And then, yeah, yeah, hopefully independence. And I remember the advice when I left the Central was, you're on your own now. And it, that, what that meant was, I have to make the decisions if something's etched enough, if something's printed properly. Those are my decisions now, and there's no one to turn to. Turn to. So as a student, and as a fellow, we offer that support for a bit longer before yeah. then you're ready to go on your own and, and figure it out yourself.
So you, yeah, you should by, but, but by going through the room, you know, you're given every chance. You're given absolutely. And as I said, it's complete openness. If students want to ask me any question about what I do, they can ask it and they'll get an honest answer. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the point is, I guess, is that you're teaching students how to be professional printmakers, aren't you? Yes. And that doesn't just come down to how you manage the room or how you no, manage your work processes. I think from a gallery point of view, I think there's something very reassuring about if an artist has gone through a studio and has been taught by, say, yourself or Norman or come, come from that lineage of, of respect for printmaking tradition, we know that it will be additioned properly and consistently, yeah. the print that they bring to us. It will be signed, it will be numbered properly. The record, the numbers will be, the addition numbers will be recorded absolutely, properly. Absolutely. There will be as many artist proofs as you tell us there are. <laughs> yeah, you know, these things are important. They are. And because it's not just because it makes organization uh, much easier, it really makes the value of the edition, the integrity of the edition is sacrosanct. And it means that collectors can trust us. And they know that what they're getting from us isn't going to be, there aren't going to be double the amount in the edition as we tell them to say there are. There aren't going to be no. double the amount of artists. Or they're going to be printed 10 more next week. Or they're going to be printed. Yeah, I mean, that's, and I think, that's, I think that, that kind of care and attention is, again, it, it's, it's why the touchstone of the tradition, of the t traditional way of doing these things. Is important. It, it, it is important. It gives you that that, that, that background and that um, that sort of understanding of what you're entering into. And you know, at the end of the day, I like to think students one day will want to get their work seen by as many people as possible. Yeah. And then in doing that, they also hopefully would like to sell that work because that will then pay for the next body of work to be made. Well, that's the interesting point. I mean, that, I mean, you'd hope that, that everybody is making work to, to get it seen. And so maybe, maybe, maybe yes. sold. And, yeah, maybe, yeah. and that's where, and that's where the sort of, that's where we as a gallery come in. And if you've got those basic factors in, in place, like a respect for the edition, respect for uh, the paper it's it's printed on. No, the, no um, dirty fingerprints. Well, yeah, yes, well, that will help. Small things know. like this, you know. They, but I mean, I always, I always say to a student, you know, your first print, imagine it's the first page of your catalogue resume and you treat, the, treat your work um, like that from then on. You will, you will make our job and therefore your job will be easier. And, you know, and it's respect for what you do as well. You know, and value it um, and, and, and look after it and do it, you can do it, do it well. You know? do it well. And that's what, I think, that's what I'd like to think we do do at the Guild, is give them that, give the student that reassurance that we're doing the best for them. Mm. to put them on this pathway to exhibiting their work and to, to, to being part of something that has um, been passed on for hundreds of years. And it's not tradition for tradition's sake. No. It's not some sort of fetishised heritage, as it were. No. We're, we're, no. I guess what we're trying to get across is that this way of doing things works. It, and it work. helps you as an artist and as a printmaker. It's not a hindrance. It's not a hindrance. It's not, it's not forward. It actually is a liberation rather than something that is there to restrict you. I, I think so. And I, I, the, the print, you know, often people walk in the room and think, oh, it looks lovely. It's, but you always have to say, it's not a museum. This is a working, semi-industrial room that has to work for everyone. Yeah. And it has to work. It just has it's to work. work. Space. It's a working space. And it, as I said, not a museum. And, and some of the equipment looks old-fashioned purely because no one's found a better way to do it. Is that, is that a fair well, way of saying it? Well, behind us, Cressy, that was built probably in 1800 or so. Yeah, And it's, you know, built to last, cast iron. And part of the, the buzz of you working with this stuff is the hands that have been on this machine before me. And we talked about it earlier, that, you know, I'll have with all of us. And that we're just as guardians for a short amount of time. Guardians is a nice way. Yeah. Custodian. Custodian. Thank you for pointing this out, actually. It segues neatly into a wider point, which um, you very kindly, uh, alongside Norman, have provided this, um, this Star Wars press we had in print. Yep. And the reason we have this is to demonstrate printmaking to collectors, to buyers. Um, because if there's one thing I've learned over the years as being a, a seller of prints, Trying to explain this to people is extremely difficult, and uh, maybe it's just me, but they send that they people do tend to glaze over quite quickly when I try and under, I try to get people to understand how prints are made. And what we're trying to do there is link these into a um, a wider tradition of how work is made. 
and the, 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 the precedent, as it were, the example of uh, print through um, centuries of work and where contemporary print has a dialogue with, with that tradition, uh, which I think is vitally important. I think it's absolutely vital. But again, the, the room's not, uh, I mean, the room's work on museums, and we are working with an age old technique, but it's not, it is a contemporary technique as well. It's living, yeah. it, it's, it's alive today, and, and hundreds of artists are working with it. Well, I think that's, a, that's an important point. Contemporary work doesn't exist in a vacuum. You no. know, it, it, it comes from somewhere. Absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, with print in particular, and particularly print techniques that have been passed on, um, it does give you this wonderful lineage, this tradition Absolutely. that you can respond to. Now, Absolutely. it's not a, as I say, it's not this museum piece. This is a vital thing, and vital in the way that it's actually living and vibrant. It's a tradition that artists can respond to, they can push against, they can uh, be inspired by, and but at least have a dialogue with. Have a dialogue with, and I think it's as much about learning these rules, but once you've learned them, once you've learned it, it's then breaking them and twisting them and bending them and making it do what you want it to do. But if you go right back to when you were taught this, it won't work unless you've done the basics underneath it. Yeah. Just won't. Or if it does, it's a fluke, and you don't know how the hell you do that. <laughs> and that can be just as frustrating as, as anything else. Well, I think I think that's uh, yeah. I think I guess that's where you, you end up in a cul de sac. If, you, <laughs> if it isn't related to an actual, you know, yeah, something you can't solid. it back. You're just yeah, you're lost. You're in a vacuum somehow. So it's important to know what you've done and how you did it. Yeah. And again, consistency. I think once the studio is set up. You don't think about it, it's just the way it is. It's not just getting in the car and just turning the key. I don't you need to know. You don't need to know how the engine works. You just want it to work. You just know it works. And it gets you where I want to go. And well, it works if you look after it. It does. Yeah. And, you know, the and then again, you know, back to the room, the presses, it's simple things, keeping them oiled, keeping them looked after, just all of those things right at the bottom, of, you know, the core of what you do. Well, that's, uh, that's I mean, yes. and, and so it's drilling those sort of fundamental basics into, into, into the into yeah, industry. industry. And then you get students who just want to go a bit further with this, a bit further, a bit further, and those are the ones who become the addicts of this. Yes, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's and for that that's the enduring thing, isn't it? There's yes. this whole world of technique and technical knowledge and, that you could spend a lifetime exploring. As and well. you can also look back at the people who've done this before you. There's the people I was taught by, the people who taught them, but you can just follow this right back, and you can start getting some greats, you know. People. Well, you mentioned the idea of standing on the shoulders of giants, True. this whole lineage yeah, sure. and this heritage of, of art. I mean, who, who springs to mind in particular when, it, when you think about the giants that you see? I think you, there's, 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 there's a holy trinity in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got to go Rembrandt, Boyer and Picasso. All of them really drilled into this technique and, and were addicted to it. I think, you know, even Picasso with all the other avenues, Etching and printmaking for him was absolutely fundamental. And yeah. some of most, probably arguably some of the most crucial of his works. I think they're vital. There, there's a there's an there's an intensity to them because I think I think with um, Picasso and print, he's really grappling oh, with some sure. creative challenges. Absolutely. There. If you think about his lino cuts and how he responded to that with inventing yeah. the suicide cut, you've got yeah. his incredible etchings as well. Yeah. Sugar lift, it's the sugar, sugar lift, yeah. and, and the way he used to get through scraped burnishers in the studio, apparently he used to get through almost one a week or he'd wear them out. And that's that's a scraping away of the plate. And you know, Rembrandt completely took plates apart and then rebuilt them. And you can really feel that hands on mm. experience. Of what and so, I suppose you, you talk about this holy trinity there as, a, as an etcher in particular, mm. these are the ones that are sort of figureheads for you. Those are the ones that are there, something. Absolutely, and you know, you look at Goya's appetites and they you know to, to die for, and a man who first started to exploit that process, but at the same time, just to, I mean, some of the to complete 80 a series of 80 plates is phenomenal mm. and have a consistency. Working 300 years ago, maybe 300 years, yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah. but you know, and the thing that gave him that consistency in that a series of etchings. Was the cast iron press yeah. that almost then opened something up for him? He realised consistency was possible, and so you and know, that wouldn't have happened without the industrial, industrial revolution. Industrial revolution. Cast iron yeah, press. Go right back. Yeah. Right back to I mean, for me, you know that that lineage and that link to industry is what grabbed me to start with, and then 
it ne it's never left. So it's, it's, it is, that is a telling point for you, is that the, the actual Absolutely. mechanics of the mechanics, the smell presses you, the smell of oil, the smell of the oil, the cast iron, the, 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 the sort of these are solid machines. Absolutely. I, 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 I still have that buzz and to own machines that do this. Do you think this is something in common with other printmakers as well? I think, do you think that's do. something that that love of I the do. history of the making as well and, and the machines that they were the these machines works are made they have, you know, you think that people have had them before you, and yeah, you probably have them after, after you, I'm afraid, you know, it will happen, but yeah, you, you are tied to the machine without these machines, you cannot do the, the job, and um, again, that goes right back to teaching and teaching that respect. Um, not to take these things for granted, they need looking after and you need to know how to use them. So it's about looking after them. You need to look after them. You look after them, they'll look after you. I always think, you know, those, and you've got to respect them. And you can't mess around with them. You know, you can lose a finger, you can lose an arm, you know, they have to be looked after. I think that's a, that's a point worth <laughs> stressing. Um, it would be lovely to hear from any other printmakers out there, maybe, if they, if they have a similar feeling about the machines they work with. Uh, but we can, so do, do um, send us your questions if you have any. Um, I just wonder, this whole idea about the, tr the printmaking tradition as a creative thing to work with. Mm. I mean, you've been um, very generous and come, you've talked to us in the gallery uh, when we did our Goya show, for yeah. example, the same about Picasso. I know um, Michael Barrett's been in talking about Rembrandt. Anita Klein has talk, done wonderful talks about Picasso and Chagall. Um, Norman Ackroyd taught, uh, showed us the sugar lift that he learned yeah. from Picasso's printmaker in Paris. So this is, this is something that we enjoy in, in the gallery um, and the way that in our program of shows, and it's not just to sell old masters as it were, or modern masters, but it is to, as I say, show where contemporary work comes from in relation to a tradition. And I think that it helps elevate print as an art form to show to buyers that it is linked to some of the finest, you know, artists. Absolutely, absolutely. And it also reassures buyers as well, you know, that there is a wonderful heritage and a sort of credibility behind this art form. And I think it, it appeals to people who collect too. Yeah. You can collect parts of this lineage, you can go right back to buy a Picasso, you can buy a print etching that was made yesterday somewhere, and you just feel part, as an artist you feel part. Well that's what I'm trying to that. get to, is that how this shapes you as an artist, this mm. response to um, the printmaking tradition as it were. I mean, I mean, fundamentally I think being taught to etch saved, saved me, I mean I, I just I didn't know where where else can I go really with this working in art, being in a student in art school? The etching studio just opened everything up for me. And then the more I looked at the other artists working with this, I thought, I, I'm your part of something which is interesting, which is, which is, which is, which is magical to think. I, 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 do, I do a sugar lift. I was taught, my number to a sugar lift. He was taught from Picasso's studio to do this. Picasso was taught, yeah, it, it just goes right back and back. You know, working with Aquatine, what Goya was working with, and still. I see. I can see how Goya did it, and and I can be part of that. That's and then, and it's when I teach, become a part of that. Do you incorporate so this in your teaching to students? Are you do you, do you make them aware of I, of this? I always make some sort of you know a, a joke about. It. I, I didn't invent this. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I didn't invent. It. So yeah, you make them you make them realize the context that they're working in, and how this is to be respected but not as a museum, but, but to be respected and worked with, manipulated it. You can do what you want with it. Just like Picasso made it do what he wanted it to do. You can do that as well. I think, that, I think that's it, isn't it? Is that you want to, it's a challenge as well as, a, mm. as an inspiration. Right. It's like, what do you, what can you add to this? Absolutely. Uh, you, I, mean, I think that's, that's when it becomes extremely exciting as well. It's like that thought of, okay, I've got my head around this, these skills that have been passed on to me. I've got, I know my way around the press. Yeah, I'm not going to kill myself in an no, no, no. <laughs> What can I do now that can push this forward? And that's the idea again about this being a, a living thing. It's a living print thing. tradition. Yeah. And it's not just walking in the studio with an idea, I'll turn this into print, 10 minutes later you have a finished print on paper. 
what we are really about, and I think what I, you know, my work is about, and what I try and convey in the teaching, it's the struggle. It's the, it's the, it's being involved in that struggle. It's really where it, it's what you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's not so much the finished article. It's nice to have it when it happens, but when you look back at the day or the week you've been in the studio, it was the engagement and the struggle that you had with that. And I, I try and really let the students know that that's this is it. It's not that's valuable. Reason. It's valuable. That's the value. So it's not just some masochism here that it has to be hard no. to be valuable. No, no, no. At all. You it's actually not. learn more through the, the and, and you enjoy. I realise you know, it takes a while, but you do realise it's what you enjoy. I really, I enjoy being up to my elbows in ink and what that's that's and, and I like passing that on to the students. That, this is what you do. This is this is the struggle you're entering into. It's not easy, but God, it's rewarding when it works. I think that's that is worth emphasising. I mean, I I'm fascinated by print technique. I'm fascinated by print makers. Mm. I think it's a I think it's a difficult path to choose in some ways because you know as we know as a gallery, it's print is um, not valued as highly as it maybe should be in this country, certainly in this country compared to other art forms. Yeah. And certainly one thing that we're very conscious of trying to do is educate our, educate buyers yeah. as to the value of print, how that is made is intrinsic to that Absolutely. and how it is linked to yeah. a, a wonderful heritage is also important as well. I think that's absolutely crucial. I mean, without, without that teaching, right at the very beginning, when I'm working with foundation students, for instance, you can't have that in the gallery. It would break yeah. down. You have to have it. A printmaker needs to be built ready for that gallery. Interesting. You're, you're ready now. You have that background and knowledge. And you have this, this wealth of precedent to sustain you as well in some of the what will be dark days when you're oh, don't be dark days. <laughs> <laughs> but also go back to you you need you do need as a as an artist as well you need a gallery that does support you in that as well not all galleries will get the printmaking tradition not all galleries will understand what nature goes through to make this and to have a gallery that really does understand that and is willing to to be part of yeah, do. I think no, that's, that's really important. important. That's an important point. I think we certainly see ourselves as a gallery, as a bridge between a printmaker and a collector mm. or, and a buyer. But what we're trying to do from both sides of, of, of the bridge, as it were, is that we're trying to encourage printmakers to continue work and have mm. a platform for their work to show. Um, but also we're trying to turn buyers into collectors. We're trying to help buyers become as addicted to printmaking as we have become ourselves yeah. and as and as passionate about it as the artists that what produce the work um, and actually the way to do that we found is to have a program of talks artist talks yeah. about work about artists talking about other artists work so as I was mentioning yeah. earlier so Jason talking about Picasso and Goya etc the idea of a print tradition being a place that you can navigate and explore with as a buyer, as a collector, with a gallery. But the best people to guide you through that are artists, in my opinion. And I, think I think that's, that's really yeah. fascinating. And I think you need a gallery, as I said, to give you that platform as well to talk about it, to talk about what you do. It is important to reach the collectors, to talk to them and to let them, give them an insight to just to what, what goes on. But then again, the gallery also buys you time to go back to the <laughs> studio where I don't have to talk every day about what I'm doing. No, no, that's it. So it does give you that time back in the studio and you know that they'll hopefully want to see what you've done this year. Well, we're always, we're always excited to see. Uh, that's good. We do have a couple of questions, actually. So why don't we, um, why don't we take a look? No, this is a technical one. Okay. Um, um, so best. this is Jeannie. Um, I noticed you often work with three plates. How do you etch an ink a plate evenly? I have to say, I really like the tonal quality of your work and the way you display your multi-plate prints edge to edge. Do you make your own frames, it says? Oh, um, <laughs> well, the answer to that, I, know, I do not make my own frames. I have a stock of frames where I can slip prints into them, but no, I don't make the frames. The consistency of working on three plates is to have three acid baths. Each acid bath is made at exactly the same um, strength on the same day, and all the plates are etched in each bath. You make a note of which plate is going in each bath, and you have that, they go in at the same time, they're timed at exactly the same time, 
and then taken out obviously at the same time. And so we have three baths, give you that consistency. And printing to the edge, I agree, I really like doing full bleed printing. Um, it makes, it creates a bit of mystery, I always think that. Is that an etching? Is it an etching? Is it a drawing? Mm. Because you just, is it, does it draw attention to the paper as well? I think it does. Because like, we've talked yeah. about how important paper and overlooked paper is actually yeah, in, yeah. in the artwork. Again, uh, paper and ink are crucial. Good paper, you've got to use good paper, it's good ink. And you know, if you, if you skimp on the paper, you just, the quality isn't there. And also, that's it when you work in the galleries, you've got to work with good paper, work with good ink, you get what you pay for. Think very much so, I think, you know, and, that, and that again, respect for materials is, is something uh, I guess you'll learn at City and Guild. Oh, you, 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 will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you will. Um, but yeah, well, thank you, Jeannie. Thank you for the question. If there are any more, please, um, please send them our way. Um, I mean, we could, uh, I, I think there's a few I, more on the QA um tab. Sorry, yeah, I can see them there. That's great. Oh, really? We're just through the chat here. Thank you for that. Okay. So Hannah, do students from across the foundation fine art, conservation, carving, art history courses learn etching or have the chance to? Uh, yes, every student at City and Guilds will have an opportunity to work in the print studio with me and my team. Obviously, foundation all have an induction, but yeah, we've just also recently done conservation inductions. Uh, so yeah, every student has an opportunity to work in the print room. That's great. Okay. Um, Catherine has a question. Um, can you describe how you got your first press and how do you sustain your work alongside your teaching? Wow. Okay. Well, Catherine is an ex fellow of mine who's now teaching at Putney School of Art. So he's in the business. Um, I just, how do you want to sustain your work? Um, I work every day in the print studio. So I teach two or three days a week. Um, and then work for the rest of the time in my own studio. As I said, the studios are laid down, so I don't feel as if I'm being wrenched from my studio when I go in to teach. And it's working every day. There's no such thing as a weekend. They're just working days. Um, so yeah, working every day. And my first press, my first press was bought from, I bought this one. This is it. I bought it from the Royal Academy via Norway. We would loaned it. To the Royal Academy, and I bought it for the people to him by them. So, yeah, there you go. So, that's it. That's the first press. And I now, the other press, my other major press I own now, um, I bought from Norman. He, and it's only been owned by four people since it was an industrial press. So, yeah, on the fourth. You're the fourth. Yeah, so. um, we have a, quite a few questions here. So, let's get through some more. So, Martin asks um, Can you say something about the balance between tradition and innovation and experimentation in teaching and studying? You rightly stress the tradition and continuity, but students, fellows, and artists will be pushing the boundaries as well. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we encourage them to push the boundaries. Absolutely. I think that's what we're trying to say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This, this, isn't, this isn't something to be slavishly adhered no, to. No, 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 not at all. It's, it's something to be learnt and then and, and played, played with as well. I think it's nice to play with it as well. Just, and just yeah, have fun with it. Really have fun with it. So I think what we teach are these traditions, but we also then encourage innovation. I think that, again, stressing that there's something about the structure of print, though, that you have to acknowledge yeah. you, you or you or you'll make a complete mess <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's about learning the rules in, in order to break them absolutely you and, yeah. and, and, and you know you can at your peril you miss things out and see just see what happens victoria um as a painter who moved into print i have a real sense of the print community in these great traditions i wonder how these traditional quite toxic substances that are great to use in a fully equipped studio but not so good for the environment do you think we as artists have a responsibility for that? Uh, yeah, I think we do to a degree. And I, I, this is a question I get quite often, the worry of the toxicity and the um, dangers of what we do. I, I again go back to teaching. I, I, I think you're, you're taught, if you're taught properly, you're taught how to use them safely. You're taught how to use them to a minimum. You're taught how to look after yourself and how not to just wash everything down the sink that you think will be okay. There are, there are rules and you need to know what you can put down the sink and not. So this is part of it as well, isn't it? I you mean, this is you're taught how you to do this. I think- um, To look after yourself as well. 
we have uh, on a similar subject, we have Grace here um, who asking, what do you think about safe etching and modern ways of substituting methods, i.e. airbrushing acrylic aquatint instead of powdered rosin? Okay. Many art schools are getting rid of traditional methods to prioritize health and safety concerns. Do you think that they are equivalent to processes? Um, I don't think, personally, I prefer the traditional methods because they work. I don't have to worry that's I don't have to worry about consistency I know what I do works I find some of the safer methods then employ, uh, employ chemicals at some point which I would find more dangerous than the things I work with Interesting. Um, but I, again it goes back to teaching I think there's nothing wrong with aquatine resin if you're taught how to use it properly and safely um, and I know a lot of etchers who live live to a great age working with this stuff and um, I think again back to teaching work safely and if you can't use these um, traditional methods then of course wherever you're working work with what you've got but you know again uh, again goes back to teaching you have to be taught properly yeah. how to use these methods I don't think safe etching or what they call a safe etching or non-toxic is a shortcut I think yeah. again you don't have to know what you're doing thank you properly. thank you for that Grace um, we have an, um, another question here. J Jason, when making prints, do you prefer to be alone in the studio in a more busy environment? Um, that's an interesting point. Uh, definitely think. alone. Um, I, 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 mm, so I've worked in some, very, did some great workshops and studios around the country. Personally, I like working on my own. Um, I spread out a lot. I, I, I make a mess, as it were. <laughs> so no, I like, I like working alone. I like being able to uh, leave the studio knowing that nothing's been touched when I go in the next oh, day. And I can work all night if I need to, or early in the morning, and I, everything is just as I want it to be. So again, do you, do you, when do you do your best work? Are you nocturnal? Is it, do you say uh, I'm, a bit, not, I'm, a, I'm a night owl. No, it's not, I'm not a morning person. The morning is, I uh, get the paper ready, I get the ink sorted out, I, I get the studio set up, I just get preparation, but after lunch is when I really... And is there uh, a rhythm to those processes, I guess? That's a way into the opening the creative yeah. mind up a bit more. I mean, I, that, that printmaking gives you that, doesn't it? It does. There's it always gives, stuff you can There's always stuff, absolutely. And I think was, I read some of the sculptor David Smith said that. There's always stuff to do in the, in the studio, and it's the sort of idea of you're oiling the presses, you're getting the paper ready, you're changing the blotters, you're polishing the metal. There's something to do before you actually start making that commitment. And more practical than yeah. faffing about. Absolutely faffing about. <laughs> like, when I'm prevaricating about writing something, you know, rearranging a sock drawer. Oh, yeah. it's, it's actually... <laughs> there is the equivalent. Sort of, there is the equivalent. I'm sure there is. But yeah, no, really, there's always something to do in the studio. And I, I am better. Once, I, once I'm everything settled, and then I'm probably only really productive for about two hours a day. But what are two hours? Not bad, not yeah, bad no, at all. I'm a, I'm a solitary worker, I'm afraid. Um, Paul Letters has asked, um, this is a um, uh, question about City and Guilds, do, you, uh, do they do any online Zoom printmaking courses at all? Not at the moment, but it's something we have been talking about the possibility of doing. So not at the moment, but it, Keep, keep in touch with us, we, we may be doing that soon. Okay, okay. I mean, it seems it, it in the light of what we've been talking about, absolutely, um, uh, and the need to almost be present there. I mean, I'm not saying it, it can't work, but it's something that well, it, it, you know, it, 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 work. it can definitely happen. But I think it could work in a way of, of, of seeing how it's done, but again, I would go back to the way you really want to get involved in this business is to get your to hands do, on it, get, get, get your hands on it. But we're definitely, we're definitely something we're thinking about. Thanks. Well, that's good to hear. Well, maybe I should give it a try as well. No, I certainly can't break anything. Maybe I should give it a zoom, zoom a try. Zoom a try. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think we're drawing to an end here. I mean, we do have some, uh, if there's, there's a time for a, a couple more questions, if there are any out there. Um, but I just wanted to reflect on what we've discussed. I mean, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there. And I think the point is that, again, trying to assert or, or remind people that the idea of a traditional method is a vibrant thing. It can be a vital in, in, in a creative, Absolutely. you know, it's a creative source of, uh, you know, uh, something positive to work with. It is, and it's not, I, I don't, I, as I said earlier, it shouldn't be seen as a hindrance, this process. It should be seen as a, a means to production. It should be yeah. a way of making what you want to make. And it's not for everyone. 
But if you are, are in this business, you can really, really run with it. it yeah. And learning in the proper way just gives you that complete backup. And, and the print room at City and Guilds has really code that has, wow. has found a, a way of expressing this and embodying this idea. It has, and it's given me a way of passing on the knowledge, the, the little knowledge I have in this video, you know, being able to pass that on to people, which I normally wouldn't have. I should, uh, one of the questions was, I work on my own. And the only way that this process and this magical process for me will, will continue is it by being taught. Yeah. If it's not taught, it dies. And that's, I think, is a problem which, you know, I would like to see to happen. We have some other last minute questions coming in. Hannah, I think it's at City and Girls, just on that point, says, okay. um, Etching Fundamentals week-long course is being announced mid-December for July oh, 2021. There we go. Okay, so that's the summer school. Um, Jenny asks, Jason, do you use a sketchbook? Yes, all, all of the work I make comes from drawings I make in the landscape. So I have a two-week walk or a, a meandering walk sometimes, but I always take sketchbooks. I don't use a camera. So then it's a sketchbook to take it back to the studio where I photocopy every page. They're pinned up on the studio wall. And that's when I start selecting the information that builds the etchings that I make. So yeah, everything's from the sketchbook. So it comes from the drawing. Everything's from the drawing. It's interesting, isn't it? And um, I think uh, we have Sue just talking about how important framing of a work is. It always puzzles me that a beautiful print on fabulous paper is then covered by the mount. Um, I think that's something you, you think kind that, of... Yeah, there's two ways. I mean, I, I do like seeing the edges of the paper, um, of course, but sometimes it's just taste. Some collectors like a window mount and they prefer it. Yeah. Others want to see the edge of the paper. And I think the nice thing about this studio, that, Eames Print Room Studio is they're showing work unframed, mm. so you can see the edges of the paper. There is a point where you have to let the, the work go if it's going to sit on someone else's wall. It's I guess there room. is <laughs> there is anymore. that point. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and, and frame. That's one of the reasons I don't frame. It's it's a very personal thing. Yeah, people want to work. That's, I think that's something we've certainly learned over the years. Is, yeah. you know, you can have a view on it. Um, mm. But at the end of the day, it's it's going into someone's house. So Absolutely, it has to match their sofa or something. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and just the last comment here, I think um, Martin, thank you for this. Highly recommend the City and Guilds Art School Summer School One Week Etching Fundamentals, which I did in 2019. Really hands on. There's the point we were making. Made me appreciate the huge skill, technique, and dedication which goes into printing. Um, and he's a trustee. There you go. Well, thanks, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Martin. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And we're getting some thanks here. Thank you, Deborah, for your um, uh, comments there. Loving Jason's work and thoroughly enjoyed the session. Well, I hope well, everyone thank you. has. Thank you. I know that we certainly. It's have. been fun. It's, it's been, been good. Fun. It's, it's been, been good. And, um, and yeah, um, enjoy the enjoy the fair. I hope that's been useful. And enjoy the rest of the fair, indeed. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent, for hosting us. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.